The global water cycle keeps our planet alive. The rivers are its arteries. Rivers run down mountains through forest, flow through desert and delta, course through bended bay and swerving shore, and recirculate back from our ocean. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. Access to water has defined where human populations have flourished. Civilization emerged between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers on the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia in modern-day Iraq. Now we are changing the carbon and nitrogen cycles. We are altering the global water system too, through damming, extraction, irrigation and climate change. Many rivers no longer reach the sea. We move more sediment than natural erosion and rivers. We've built 48,000 large dams. We've drained half of global wetlands. We use an area the size of South America to grow our crops, an area the size of Africa for our livestock. Agriculture accounts for 70% of global freshwater use, and we need to feed a growing population. We have altered Earth's snow cover, sea ice and ocean volume fundamental elements of the water cycle. Climate change will bring more flooding, drought and disease. A warmer atmosphere holds more water vapour. This is causing the water cycle to intensify. Wet regions are becoming wetter, dry areas drier. Rainfall patterns are changing. Damming, mining and extraction are causing two-thirds of major deltas to sink. Almost 800 million people have no safe drinking water. 2.4 billion remain without adequate sanitation. 1.7 billion people live in places where groundwater is being extracted faster than it can be replenished. Four out of five people worldwide face risk to their water security. Water. It is an essential building block of life constantly moving in a hydrologic cycle that flows in a continuous loop above, across, and even below the Earth's surface. But water is also constantly moving through another cycle, the human water cycle, which powers our homes, hydrates our bodies, irrigates our crops, and processes our waste. The tight connection between water, food, and energy also makes them dependent on one another. Our increasing need for these three vital resources is forcing us to rethink how we manage and use our water supply. The water needed to produce our food and energy typically comes from freshwater sources such as rivers, lakes, and underground aquifers. In order to make it safe for drinking, most water must be transported through a water treatment plant to remove contaminants, or in the case of salty water, through a desalination process. The southeast of England is seriously water stressed, which means a very high proportion of the water in the environment is already used to provide water for homes and businesses. Water comes from rain, so ultimately we're as good as the weather we get. As rain falls, it goes to one of four places. It either runs off the surface into rivers, soaks into the soil and gets used by plants, evaporates from plants and soil or infiltrates into the ground where it is stored in natural underground reservoirs called aquifers. 30% of the water we supply is pumped from aquifers via boreholes reaching depths of between 20 and 200 meters. The other 70% is pumped from rivers but as the vast majority of this water also comes from aquifers, groundwater is our most important source of water. For water to reach the aquifer, the ground needs to be saturated, so it soaks through to the rocks beneath. The level of water in an aquifer is called the water table. This follows the shape of the ground surface. Due to gravity, groundwater flows from places where the water table is high to where it's low. It collects in valleys providing between 65 to almost 90% of the flow in rivers. As a result, the winter is the most important time for replenishing supplies. 
The ground is wet, so rainfall can filter down, filling up underground stocks, which will keep rivers flowing through the summer when it's drier. In the summer, rainfall is much less effective in terms of boosting supplies. Although summer rainfall tops up river levels in the short term, the ground is too hard for it to soak through to the aquifers. Also, due to the heat, more water is lost to plants and evaporation. So to fill the aquifers and keep the rivers flowing throughout the year, we need steady winter rainfall. We extract water in natural environments, rivers or lakes for example. We can also draw it from groundwater tables. To protect this resource over the long term, we measure and monitor water availability, quality and extracted volumes over time. A screen covering the water intake blocks the largest objects. Then we pump the water and channel it to the drinking water production plant. First, we remove the suspended matter in the water. Here, screens block the solid waste and rakes then lift it out. Then, we add a coagulant to the water. The dust, soil particles and other residual material gradually combine into clots, which are called flocks. Gravity drags these flocks to the floor of a large settling pond and we remove them. Meanwhile, a system of inlets harvests the clean water at the surface. Then we filter the water. This is the key step during this first phase. One or several thick layers of sand capture the finest materials. In some cases, activated carbon or porous membranes can also be used. Then we disinfect the water with ozone, a gas that destroys viruses and bacteria. We can also do this with chlorine or ultraviolet rays. Lastly, we add one drop of chlorine for the equivalent of five bathtubs of water. Chlorine prevents microorganisms from developing while the water is in the network. We use sensors and run analyses to monitor water quality and adjust it if and as required at each step in the treatment process. Now the water is fit for human consumption, meaning it is perfectly safe to drink. We can store it in tanks before we distribute it to consumers. Currently, the average person in the UK uses 140 litres of water a day. In going about our everyday lives, we use a lot of water for drinking, washing, cooking, going to the toilet and much more. By using this water, it becomes polluted. The wastewater we produce is known as sewage. All the wastewater from your household activities, as well as from industry and runoff from roads, is collected in a vast network of underground sewers where it flows, sometimes pumped, to the sewage works for treatment. The underground network of sewers that collect all this wastewater and transports it to the sewage works is known as the sewerage system, and the area it drains is the catchment area. Wastewater treatment is designed to remove oxygen-demanding substances as measured by five-day biochemical oxygen demand, or BOD, solid particles, measured as total suspended solids, or TSS, and all oxygen-demanding substances, including those that are not amenable to biological treatment, otherwise known as chemical oxygen demand, or COD. Wastewater may also contain toxic substances such as cyanic compounds. As effluent discharges enter receiving streams, they contribute BOD and COD, which can diminish dissolved oxygen levels if they are not effectively treated. Low dissolved oxygen levels can induce fish kills and reduce reproduction rates in aquatic biota. Discharge of suspended matter, or TSS, may also deplete dissolved oxygen if not effectively removed from effluent. If settleable, suspended matter can blanket the stream bed, damage invertebrate populations, block gravel spawning beds, and, if organic, remove dissolved oxygen from the overlying water column. Suspended matter that does not settle may obstruct light transmission into the water column, impairing aesthetics as well as diminishing photosynthetic activity and the abundance of food available to fish and aquatic life. For these reasons, 
wastewater treatment is designed to remove BOD, COD, and TSS to levels that will not cause these effects. The first stage of treatment takes place in the influent pumping station where solid debris is removed from the wastewater. The incoming sewage passes through screens where any rags or large debris is removed. Sewage flows through these channels where road grit and sand is removed. As the water flows through this tank, it's moving very, very slowly. All the scum, fats, oils and greases are floating to the top of the surface. So we're going to collect all these fats at the front of this tank and all the heavy organic matter is settling down. The primary settlement treatment process removes a large proportion of the solid waste. This spiral tank system is used where there is limited space. As the spiral rotates, the solid particles settle on a series of plastic plates and drop to the bottom of the tank as a sludge. It's time for secondary treatment. At smaller treatment plants, filter beds are used. The partially treated sewage is continually passed over the bed of stones. As it trickles slowly down, it's attacked and cleaned by the bacteria living on the stones. Inside the trickling filters we have about 15 feet of this plastic media. Basically what's happening is as the water filters through this media, the slime starts to grow that has all these organisms and they're going to start consuming all this soluble uh, organic matter and this really finely suspended organic matter that we couldn't settle out in the primary sedimentation tanks. As larger treatment plants, an activated sludge process is used. Air is pumped into these large tanks helping the bacteria to break down the sewage. The effluent flows into the final settlement tanks, where any remaining solid particles sink to the bottom and are removed, leaving a clear liquid which can be discharged to rivers or the sea. On some coastal works, Ultraviolet light is used to kill the bacteria in the final effluent, passing below them. To recap, large materials and grit are scraped and settled out. Oils are skimmed and sludge is settled out. Then bacteria consume tiny organic materials. Then the bacteria clumps settle out. Finally, the surface water flows to the ocean or river. The sludge from the settlement stages is pumped into the digester tanks. The temperature in the tanks is kept at around 35 degrees centigrade. The bacteria, which have no oxygen, slowly break down the sludge. This process produces methane gas, which can be drawn off and stored in this gas balloon, before being used to generate electricity in a combined heat and power plant. At large sludge treatment centres, the residual sludge from the digester first has the water squeezed out and is then dried in a similar way to a spin dryer. Heat comes from burning the methane gas produced in the digestion process. The resulting granules are then used as farm fertilizer. The use of biosolids has come under considerable public and regulatory scrutiny. Regulations for wastewater solids are highly protective of human health and the environment. Water, of course, still cycles through the natural world much as it ever did. Rains, seeps and runs into aquifers, rivers and lakes and out to the ocean, all the while evaporating to form clouds and keeping the water in a continuous cycle. But now we humans have introduced some loops of our own. If water is plentiful, we source it from watersheds, treated to drinking water standards and then the used water gets cleaned up at a wastewater treatment facility and is released back into the environment to be later used again by downstream communities and eventually sent to the ocean while we look for new sources of supply. Which is just fine until there's less rain. 
and more demand. New water restrictions have been imposed in Cape Town, South Africa. In India, rising temperatures threaten to make a severe water crisis there even worse. The greatest global risks of our time, the shortage of water. By 2050, the United Nations says more than 5 billion people could be facing water shortages across the globe. Now, an existential threat. That's how the boss of the Environment Agency described the risks posed by climate change and population growth. Sir James Bevan warned that unless we all take drastic and urgent action, England could run out of water within 25 years. He wants wasting water to become as socially unacceptable as blowing smoke in the face of a baby. Escaping the jaws of death is how the head of England's Environment Agency dramatically entitled his speech today. The jaws of death, he explained, the point when rising water demand outstrips a falling supply. It could happen in 20 to 25 years' time, he warned, at the current rate. Drought risk will be higher, he said, with climate change reducing water supply and population change increasing demand. 67 million people now in the UK projected to reach 75 million by 2050. So what needs to change? Revive the era of building new reservoirs, however politically contentious, is one of his recommendations. Build more desalination plants, more sustainable drainage systems too. Get water companies to up their game on fixing leaks and help them share supply. Then the most sustainable source of water for our thirsty city may not be removing the salt from seawater or pumping water long distances, but to reuse the used water that we normally just discard. Take the nation of Namibia in the southwest corner of Africa. It's named for the Namib Desert, which is one of the oldest deserts on Earth. And yet Namibia's capital, Vinthook, isn't dying of thirst. Vinthook found a radical source of water that's abundant and available to a city of any size, no matter how dry. Here, you'll find a facility with a unique mission. While many cities usually just clean up sewage and then dump it into a river, Vindhook takes that treated water and sends it into their water recycling plant. There's a system of tanks and pipes where any leftover solid matter gets filtered out, microorganisms are killed off, and even antibiotics and hormones get broken down. The last step involves an ultrafiltration membrane. Which will filter out basically all suspended particles all bacteria and all viruses. Then it's mixed with other treated water that's collected from an underground aquifer or reservoirs for seasonal rain. Which means that every time someone in Vindhook opens a tap, about a quarter of what comes out is recycled wastewater. The system is monitored around the clock and the water is continually tested, both in the facility and in samples sent to independent labs. Since Vindhook's adopted this technology, a handful of other cities have embraced drinking their recycled wastewater. But in other places, this technology has been met with resistance. When a cholera epidemic broke out in London's Soho neighborhood in 1854, British scientist John Snow paved the way for the modern field of epidemiology by tracing the outbreak to a tainted well. So it's not surprising that the dangers of mixing drinking water and wastewater are feared. Augmenting our rivers and streams with wastewater from treatment plants might be okay for the environment, but we're planning on drinking this. So it's first thoroughly, carefully, and repeatedly processed to remove particles, pathogens, or pollutants at a water purification plant that contains multi-barrier treatment processes and advanced monitoring. Then we have to loop it back into our drinking water, which we can do in a number of ways. We can pump it all the way back up to a reservoir in the watershed or into the ground. Here it mingles with the rain and runoff, flora and fauna, which of course means it gets dirty all over again and needs to be retreated before we use it as drinking water. Or we can simply put the very clean water from the advanced purification plant straight back into our water supply. But while Vindhook might seem extreme in how it handles its wastewater, it's likely that many people are already drinking some wastewater. Everybody lives downstream of somebody Countries like the United States and Singapore have started turning treated wastewater into potable drinking water. Many people take the availability of fresh running water for granted, but reusing wastewater is becoming a necessary part of modern life. 
Singapore currently has to import water to support their population, but they are working towards becoming water independent. By treating the water and reusing it, resources are being utilized more efficiently, but some people are still grossed out by the idea of drinking water that used to be mixed with sewage. That will take your urine or even the water vapor you breathe out and recycle it into drinkable water. Sound gross? Well, guess what you've been drinking? Remember, the water cycle on Earth is a closed cycle. The water that we have at our disposal right now has been here for billions of years.